So today I'd like to talk about something with my jury rigged system here that, uh, well, it, it's people say is not a salvation level issue. And, but let's walk through it. Now, the question is, who is the bride of Christ? In any church you go to, you will probably find someone saying the, the church is the bride of Christ. And they will try to go to different parts of scripture and say, you know, this is clear. For usually Ephesians 5, and they will say, you know, it's clear that uh, the church is the bride, uh, except for the fact that it's very clear in scripture that the church is not the bride. But of course, you know, you can't see these things separated from all kinds of other issues, all kinds of other doctrine. And so basically I'm going in to probably some confused doctrine in your head and pulling out one thing and saying, look, uh, maybe you got this wrong. Of course, then it's not gonna fit back in. And so that's gonna have a cascade effect on how you understand grace and how you understand faith and how you understand scripture and its role. So in a way, this is salvation level stuff. Uh, if you're not used to studying your Bible, you're going to hate it. Uh, if you think that the church is the bride of Christ, you're not going to like it much, but let's just walk through it together. And at the end, if you say, hmm, that's a pretty good case, well, then, you know, read around. But make sure that whatever decision you come to, it is based on what the Bible says and not just, oh, here's, a, here's something from the Bible and let's see how we can fit it. No, not, not, don't fit it in. Find really plain scripture and move on from there. Now, so one place in scripture where it is absolutely positively clear is in Revelation 21. So remember, if you go into a church, everybody will tell you the church is the bride of Christ. But let's look at Revelation 21. So we'll go down to Revelation 21 verse 9, and it says, and this is the New International Version, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Well, there is nobody, okay, from Pope Francis all the way down to, I don't know, Justin Johnson, who would say, Oh, well, that's anything but Christ. I think everyone agrees that the Lamb is Christ. And so it says here, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Bride, wife, lamb. Here I will show you the bride, the wife of Christ. You say, ah, this is going to solve it. And if it doesn't solve it, Peter is going to come up with some wacky ideas and, you know, and, and try to send us down the wrong track. Well, I, I might. So, you know, so keep, keep a close eye on me. Verse 10, And he carried me away in spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. That is the bride of Christ. That is what it is. Now you say, well, what, what exactly? Is he going to marry a city? Well, I w I'd like to show you that this means that it's the nation. Yeah, so this is going to be the new Jerusalem. It's going to be paradise on earth. Here's another thing you probably have to unlearn. Not everybody's going to heaven. There are spheres of blessing. And so when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, uh, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is what he meant. This is the paradise. This is a new heaven, new earth. This is what paradise is. And that is not really for the church. Our place will be in heavenly places. 
Yeah. So there are different spheres of influence. Uh, different spheres of it. There are different spheres of blessing depending on who you are. It will be eternal life. It will be all the things that, that you know you've heard before. Uh, but it won't be all in the same place. This is the New Jerusalem. It's coming down. It's bigger than it's bigger than current day Israel, I think, uh, if I remember the the, the measurements uh, correctly. So it's it's twelve thousand stadia, which is fifteen hundred miles, which is what is that, twenty two hundred kilometers, and the current state of Israel is what about four hundred and fifty kilometers from north to, to south. So this is a huge thing. Uh, and, and this is the bride of Christ. Now, where in the heck would you get that kind of thing? Let's, let's make sure that the word bride here is really the, the word that we're looking for. And if you, if you look it up, you will see here in Revelation 21, 9, it says that the word, the Greek word for bride is nymphen. And if you go through scripture and you look where are all the places that, you know, you, you, can, you can find this, uh, you can go to Matthew 10. Uh, for I came to turn a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law Nymphen, uh, so this married in woman who was a bride against her mother in law. Uh, same thing in, in, in Luke 12, 53, the same, same kind of uh, verse. Uh, uh, John 3, 29 says, uh, It is the bridegroom who has the bride, Nymphen. And so, you know, this is clearly a bride. All right, so we've clearly got a bride here. But you say, well, no, there, Peter, you've got to interpret this within the context of Scripture. Yes, it says the New Jerusalem, but, you know, isn't that us and isn't that the church and isn't that just, you know, this general good thing coming down from heaven and we're going to be in it, but we're going to be in heaven and in the New Jerusalem and it's on the new heaven and new earth. But where, where, So you've got to understand spheres of blessing. You've got to understand what is the bride. If you want to know what your hope is, yeah? Oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to get to go, go to heaven. Okay, that's if you're good with that. But the Bible is so much richer. The Bible has so much more to give you. Now, uh, like I said, this is the, uh, this is the, the new paradise. Um, this is where... The thief on the cross says to Jesus, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, you know, I, you know, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And there's a little problem there. If I can go down a rabbit hole, uh, there's a little problem there with um, Greek because Greek doesn't have punctuation. So you have to add it. And how do you add it? Well, you look at your theology. Uh, and if you don't have really good theology or you don't understand Hebraisms or you don't understand figures of speech, then you might put the comma in the wrong place. And that's just what they did. So it doesn't read, uh, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. No, because it's got to come down. This is Revelation 21. This is going to come down. No, paradise will appear again here on the earth. But this is Jesus saying, I tell you today, I'm telling you right now, is what we might say today. Uh, I'm telling you right now, you will be with me in paradise. Now, you say, I, I find that really, really strange. How, how, how do you know where to put the comma? Well, I think it's in Deuteronomy. I'll, I'll put it in, the, I'll put it in the, the notes, in the description. I think it's Deuteronomy and Numbers where you see exactly this Hebraism, this 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 type of expression that someone who spoke Hebrew or Aramaic would have used, yeah. And and of course, if you understand spheres of blessing, then you 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 know that this is going to come later and it's going to come down. And so he couldn't be on that day, that twenty four hours with him. Uh, it also says in John that uh, no man has been in heaven except he who came out of heaven. So they weren't going to like pop up in heaven that day. 
uh, again, here, the, so you know, you can translate what's going on. You can get a much better idea of the richness and fullness of the Bible. Okay, we're going to come out of that rabbit hole and go all the way back. Let's go all the way back to the Old Testament. Let's let's build some momentum up toward the New Testament and this idea of the Bride of Christ. And we go to the Song of Solomon, and this was accepted. If you've ever read it, it's it, it's a it's a kind of risque compared to other parts of Scripture. And a lot of the rabbis at the time thought that. In fact, Muslims today will say, you know, you Christians have got this pornography. You Christians and Jews have got this pornography in your in your holy Scriptures. Uh, but it is an allegory. Uh, I'm, I'm allergic to allegories because uh, many, many, many things in current Christianity are allegorized, and that allows you to make anything out of anything. Uh, but this is an allegory, and which is why it was accepted into canon, into the scriptures. And uh, it was written by Solomon, so that, that also helped. Uh, and it is um, not to be taken as a kind of sexual desire, but for God's love of Israel. And if you don't look at it like that, then you'll do something that I found researching this from Joan Burton. Uh, it, uh, Song of Solomon, she says, is an assertion of female desire. And uh, this, is, uh, this is where the female desire and self-assertion come out. And these horrible men always had their thumb down on, on women. Uh, but here is a woman, you know, breaking out of that, you know, ignoring for the moment that it was all put together by men. So why are these men who are trying to keep women down putting in some feminist theology into the uh, to, to Tanakh. I, it doesn't make any sense. But that's those are some of the weird directions you can go if you don't understand why Song of Solomon is there in the first place. And of course, you know, when it says, um, you know, it's describing the bride and saying her neck is like a tower and her, her hair is like a flock of goats or something like this, <laughs> you know, don't try that on Valentine's Day. Yeah, you're not ever you're gonna get a Valentine's card and say, oh, you know, my lovely wife, your neck is like a tower. And you know, your your hair is like a flock of goats or a herd of goats or something like this. I mean, you know, uh, it's clearly showing uh, uh, God's relationship, uh, uh, a man and wife relationship together. Wow. Okay, that's a, that's a that's a first clue. So we've got that in um, in Song of Solomon. We also have in Isaiah. I lost my place. Yes, in Isaiah, Isaiah sixty two, which says, "For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness." And if you skip down to uh, verse 4, you shall no longer be termed forsaken. You will no longer be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hepzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. And of course, the covenant with Israel was a covenant with a people and a land, and it's all intertwined. So we can see here that here comes the new Jerusalem, presumably on the place of the old Jerusalem. Uh, and of course, at this time, there's no more sea and there's no need for the sun because you've got the, you know, you've got Christ in the middle of this, which is providing all the light. And the land the physical land, the land of Israel, the land of the Hebrews, the land of the Jews, will be called Beulah, which means married. And of course, uh, we've got a whole lot of, of, uh, of uh, 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 reason uh, to think that uh, Beulah is us. Yeah, and we've got a lot of hymns like Beulah Land, which was from the 1800s, and 
is this not the land of Beulah, you know, uh, about the United States and this beautiful, this beautiful place? Um, uh, I have entered Beulah land and dwelling in Beulah land. Uh, and, and uh, you know, these hymns were sung in the, in the church, especially at the time that, you know, where uh, there's a lot of upheaval in the church in the 1800s, and early 1900s. The charismatics are coming in, the Pentecostals are coming in, there's a lot of questioning, feminism is on the rise, a lot of, a lot of stuff is, is going on. And, you know, people were deriving some kind of sense of comfort and perspective from these very wrong hymns that were actually about Israel and not about you. But if you're into replacement theology, you think, oh, well, I'm Israel. I get all, the, all of Israel's promises. And that isn't going to work very well once we get a little deeper into Scripture. And you can be forgiven because in, in Pilgrim's Paradise, uh, we see, this is, this is John Bunyan. You were probably forced to read it one, at one time or another. And Beulah Land is a place of Peace near the end of the Christian life. It is, borders the celestial city. It's on the river of death. And that's what separates Beulah from the new Jerusalem, a city on a hill. So there's some pretty confused theology right there. And, you know, Bunyan kind of made this up and placed this stuff. And it, it makes a good story. And, of course, much of Pilgrim's progress is is inspiring kind of stuff, you know, stay on the narrow path and not the wide path because that leads to hell. But a lot of the ideas we have about hell come from Dante. You know, a lot of the ideas that we have about, you know, who inherits what and spheres of blessing and uh, the bride and the body come from, you know, secular writers that were writing this kind of stuff and didn't know uh, really. Yeah. So, you know, we've got Song of Solomon. This is showing us a relationship between God and the Jews and the, the land. We have Isaiah 62, which talks about Beulah, which means married. And it says, and your land shall be married. Yeah. Not the Gentiles, not the Gentile land, not the people, not those people. No, this is under covenant. And as we move on from there, uh, we see other references to Israel, to the Jews, uh, to the Hebrews as the wife or the bride. So uh, in Ruth, we see uh, this concept of the kinsman redeemer, that there is a covenant. There was a covenant within the tribes, which will lead to, uh, in, the, in Israel's case, a prospering kingdom. Uh, and, and in Ruth's case, uh, she was able to find uh, someone under this covenant, under this um, law, under this, uh, what, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not a law, it's a cultural, it's a... Ah, Anyway, I forgot it. Uh, that she could count on a kinsman redeemer to uh, to take to take care of her and to keep uh, her husband's name going. This was a rule within uh, with within the within the Jewish culture. We see in Ezekiel Ezekiel sixteen thirty two. It says Israel is like a wife that commits adultery. The, Jew, the Gentiles are never referred to as a wife, uh, and, and, but, but, but Israel is. Uh, Ezekiel 16.38, so you just go down the page just a little bit. Israel is judged as a woman who breaks wedlock. And you see this, you'll see, and we'll get into Hosea in a second, where you know, Hosea was like, God said, go marry a prostitute. And, and you know, this is sort of a reflection. This is a type and a shadow of God marrying the, 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 the nation. And the nation goes off and prostitutes herself. And then it comes back and it goes off and prostitutes herself. And, you know, it, and, and so, you know, in the end, it all comes right. But, uh, but we'll see more of that in just a, in, in just a second. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 3, verses 1, and then I'll skip down to 14. If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, should he return to her again? You might say, no. Uh, would not the land be completely defiled? Ha, ha, ha. Here's this land stuff again. But you 
have lived as a prostitute. He's saying you, you know, the nation. But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers. Would you now return to me, declares the Lord. And we jump down to 14. Return, faithless people, declares the Lord. For I am your husband. I will choose you, one from a town and two from a clan, and bring you to Zion. So instead of you know, this idea of, oh, you know, the Christ is the body and then we're the body and then Christ is the body too, but we're the church and all of that kind of marries itself and isn't that very elegant? No, I mean, it doesn't go along with the sort of the momentum and the, and, and, and the um, intention of, of Scripture going way back into the Old Testament. Let's look at Isaiah 50 verse 1. Where is the bill of your mother's divorce whom I have put away? So there's this sort of back and forth with God being married to the Jews. And Israel is seen as an unfaithful wife. So like I said, we go over to Hosea. So Israel, in this case, seen as unfaithful and and a set-aside woman. Uh, Jezreel means scattered or sowing. This was the name of one of uh, his children. Loruma uh, is not having obtained mercy. That's what the name means. The lo is, is not. Lo ami, and that is not my people. Okay, and so, you know, uh, there are many times when the nation uh, is in captivity. They're outside of, of God's plans. And so if you want to know why the distance in time between Daniel 9, his 70 weeks, Uh, of prophecy doesn't exactly come out to say, oh, well, after those 70 weeks, because each day was a year, uh, after those 70 weeks, um, whammo, here comes Christ, because it's actually rather longer. And you think, oh, the prophecy didn't really come true, but the prophecy did come true, because every time the Jews were low ami, the clock stopped on Daniel's prophecy. And if you take all those places, you can find these in Judges. If you take all those places out where the clock is stopped and add those on, well, you come out to right when Jesus came, perfectly on time. So Hosea 2 says, she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Yeah. So, you know, this is distance, this disloyalty, this prostitution, really, uh, what's going on. Uh, and, and, but at the end, <laughs> at the end, it's a happy ending. Uh, all is reversed and restored. I will betroth you unto me forever, says the Lord. And he says, I will sow. So that is Jezreel. Remember the, the name of Hosea's kids. I will sow her unto me in the earth. And I will have mercy unto her that has not obtained mercy. Ah, that's another one of his kids. And I will say unto them which are not my people, lo a third of uh, the third child, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. So some may say, well, Peter, you know, you've missed all of my favorite verses in which I prove that this, you know, the church is the bride. Of Christ. Okay, so we've I've, we've got the Old Testament. We've built up this momentum, and we're coming into the New Testament. And all of a sudden, we go to Second Corinthians, and it says, "Oh, that you would put up with me in a little foolishness." So Paul's going to make kind of a a, a a very black and white, maybe, or or or, or some kind of metaphor here that uh, that they may laugh at or they may find somewhat in- inappropriate. He says, do put up with me, for I am jealous for you with a jealousy that God inspires, for I have promised you in marriage to a single husband, to Christ, that I may present you to him as an undefiled virgin. Aw, oh, dang. Okay, so... So here is Paul saying, 
we are the bride. I mean, what more, what more evidence do you want here? Well, Paul is using a figure of speech here. Uh, the word for uh, promised, okay, is harmozo. Yeah, this is the one of the words underlying the word harmony. You will be brought into harmony with a single man. So the word here is aner, and you can translate aner as husband, and that's a perfectly good translation, or just a man. Yeah, so you very easily could read this as, um, oh, that you would put up with me in a little foolishness, do not or do put up with me, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy God inspires. For I have promised to harmonize you with one man, to Christ, that I might present you to him as an undefiled virgin. Okay, well, then you get this undefiled virgin, and you say, Peter, you're messing with the with the text here and you're not qualified to do that and you're you know you're just trying to wiggle out of this well not really because i think it really is a um it really is a uh, a metaphor for something and there is nothing here and and words matter there is nothing here that says you will be the bride of christ this is this is nothing compared to the verses that we read out of the Old Testament. It's simply trying to say, this is how I want to present you. Because the church is also presented as a building. But you don't think we are the building of Christ. The church is also presented as an athlete. Yeah. So this is just one more metaphor. And the reason I kind of uh, moved it around and said, I want to harmonize you with one man is, is to say, okay, if, if, there are different ways to 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 um, to, to translate this. And this is not just purely you are, I'm making you the bride of Christ. It doesn't, uh, you, you could, it could be, it could be. Yeah. I mean, it's not stupid people that think these things. It's not stupid people that go to this verse. It could be that if it weren't for all the other verses. Okay. So it could be, all right, so you say, well, you haven't convinced me there. Okay, fine. Uh, what's, what's your other argument? And, and you may say, Ephesians 5. Go to Ephesians 5.22, and this will knock it on the head, and then you can stop recording. All right, let's read that. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Absolutely. For the husband is the head of the wife. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. Aha, uh -huh. ah, so we're, we're, we're being compared to the church, yeah, the ecclesia. Now, ecclesia, you can use this for all kinds of stuff. There was a riot, and uh, Paul says this, this uh, uh, rioting ecclesia, it's just a group of people getting together uh, for a special uh, purpose. And he is the savior of the body. He's the savior of the body. He's the head of the church. The husband is the head of the wife. The perfect husband. Okay, we get it. Therefore, verse 24, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. 25, husbands... Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. This is not a King James uh, translation because in the King James it says it. Yeah? So you say, well, he gave, he gave himself for her, and there you have it. Uh, well, no, not really. And that's why the King James did say it. Uh, because it is it is a gendered word, ecclesia. The the, the a at the end makes it uh, a feminine. It's a gendered word, like you would have. We don't have that in English, but you have it in in let's say um, fr French. Uh, ecclesia is a feminine word, but gender isn't the same as sex. Uh, we we very often refer to a ship in a female 
way in, in English, you know. She's a good old ship, uh, but it doesn't represent females. Yeah, that's just how we refer to it. In French, you might say la table, and that's feminine as well. Uh, but it is not sex. It is, it is simply a gendered word. Okay, so 26, uh, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. I said her. Present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So the bride is going to be the perfect husband? huh? No, this is all about the body and taking care of the body and being in the body. And we will see that the body is one group, is one ecclesia, and the bride is a different ecclesia. It is the nation. So in Ephesians 5, what do we see? Just as a little overview of that. He is the savior of the body. That's in 5.23. We are members of that body in 5.30. And no man hates his own flesh. In the new creation, the perfect man or husband of Ephesians 5 will be united with the bride who is a different group and a different calling except for those people who have replacement theology and think that the church today is Israel. God will join them together. You say, well, God already did that. And I, I think I read some place it said there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no Scythian, there's no barbarian. Right. Because we are now under grace. We are not under prophecy. We are under mystery. And the mystery is that the Gentiles are brought in. And the mystery, this was not revealed. This is before the foundations of the world, not prophecy, which is since the foundations of the world. So this time, this grace time has opened up. And within the grace time, it doesn't matter who you are. This is how you come to Christ. That doesn't mean that Israel doesn't have a role to play. And it doesn't mean that God is not going to be following up on his promises to the nation. So to imagine that the church the body of Christ, the perfect husband, is also the bride, doesn't make any sense. To imagine that the church is the bride is replacement theology that only a Roman Catholic could completely appreciate. <laughs> um, and to imagine that the church is the bride removes God's promises from Israel and puts them on you, making it impossible for God to live up to these specific promises. So let's just recap. We go back. Song of Solomon says this stuff. Isaiah says this. Jeremiah says this. Ezekiel is comparing all that all it's always, you know, uh, God and his people, a husband and his wife. Hosea is doing this. You see, this is a consistent theme through the Old Testament. Uh, and let's just fast forward all the way to the almost the end. Uh, Revelation 21, it says, the bride is in New Jerusalem completely connected to the nation, completely connected to the land, completely coherent with the uh, Old Testament. But we have these two problem areas. One is from, uh, from Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 11. And uh, there we say, well, you know, um, you know it, he's using a metaphor, he's using a simile, he's, he's, it, it, but it's confusing because he's saying, I want to present you like a chaste virgin or a, a, a spotless virgin or something like that. And Peter Gillis tried to wiggle out of that and give it a different translation. No, I didn't try to do that. Uh, I'm just pointing out that if we look at all of the references to this subject, uh, it, th 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 this doesn't fit in there. It doesn't fit at all. If we go through the Old Testament, we go all the way to Revelation, it's very clear 
that the church is not the bride. Yeah. Oh, well, how about Ephesians? Ephesians is talking about the perfect husband, the perfect man, the perfect husband, the perfect aner. Um, and this is Christ's body. So we've got the body in Ephesians, and we've got the bride coming at the end, and the lamb, okay, we are, we are in Christ. We are the body, the lamb, which is Christ, is going to marry the bride, which is the new Jerusalem. It's physical. It's connected to the nation. It's got, uh, oh, that's one more thing I didn't, in, in my research, I should just tell you. One guy came up with a very interesting, he says, well, you see, it is for the nation, but you've got these gates, and at each gate is one of the apostles. And the apostles were Christians. So it's for both. And you think, wow, actually, that's a pr pretty, pretty clever way to look at it. The problem is, is that the apostles did not come to the Gentiles. Yeah, well, with their words, yes, but they went to the nation. There is an apostle for the Gentiles, and that is Paul. And he doesn't say anything. So all of that, all the apostles, all the gates, the size of it, the 1,200, all of these things, the 12 tribes, all of that is purely nation, purely Jewish and fits perfectly with all the stuff that was said and promised in the Old Testament, now coming true at the end of times in Revelation. And the Lamb is going to, Christ is going to marry and make this all complete. And that is how you should understand it. You and I in the church are the body of Christ and the bride of well, she still needs to get dressed and prettied up before all that can happen. So I hope this was a helpful and interesting. If you don't think I've got it right, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love for you to point me in, in the right direction. Uh, but I think I made a pretty good case there and I had some pretty good sources. So uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident, but I might have missed something. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time. Take care.